Uh, the next presentation may be a lesson in never plan presentations over beer with Alan. So, <laughs> so the, the schizophrenia panel that you're about to um, be subject to was born in a bar in San Francisco. And um, Alan's going to take us through uh, the notion of persona in this. Identity is schizophrenia. Uh, or how users want to apply their online identities. Uh, so, so again, uh, this was uh, this panel was kind of put together at the last minute. So again, uh, thank you to all the panelists for uh, agreeing to be on the panel. Uh, Don and I uh, uh, and Greg Keister from January were having a couple beers in San Francisco one night, and we're like, how about if we uh, change the format of the uh, of the Open ID Summit and have uh, something a little bit more general interest uh, to the attendees, uh, something more topical, because uh, definitely identity and also what we're going to talk about real names and common names and so on. Definitely been in the in the news lately. So, uh, so. Was there? <laughs> oh well, well, well lately this is uh, a right? <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, just a quick introduction. Uh, so I'm I'm the moderator. So I'm Alice Hamlin of the Open ID Foundation, and uh, we have panelists uh, Andy Wu, uh, Larry Dreams is in second place, and uh, Frank Asai and uh, Kevin Marks. So uh, you guys, how about if you, uh, you uh, introduce yourselves and uh, talk a little bit about um, what you're doing and why, what your company does in identity? So uh, Andy, how about if you start first? So uh, I'm Andy Wu again. So I'm from Yahoo. I work on the uh, with the, what we call Yahoo membership that's responsible for user authentication, which include OpenID, OAuth, and so forth. Um, so also part of the account management team. Uh, Larry Grievous is Jan Rain, and Jan Rain uh, has a SaaS user management platform. Authentication is a huge piece of that. Uh, we're deployed on several hundred thousand websites, and uh, we employ a bunch of very smart identities. So we speak uh, a lot of OpenID, a lot of OAuth, um, a lot of identity protocol. I'm Farhan Kassai, I work for eBay Inc. And uh, I do uh, identity across eBay Inc. Uh, this shall be known as I stop commerce from now on. Uh, this is a new company that eBay starts to basically provide services to all the sellers and, and to e-commerce. And one of the core pieces of the services that eBay is planning to offer is obviously identity. But before that, uh, eBay is about 30, 35 companies across the 30 lo uh, locales. So we are internally IDP to our own properties and we are RP to our own properties. And we have been dealing with issues of identity because commerce is very closely related to the issue of identity uh, for, for years that we've done. So uh, Salesforce provides um, customer relationship management to um, many large companies, um, but we're also moving um, to providing um, what we're calling social enterprise services, which is encouraging the companies that um, are using Salesforce services to extend through to their customers, which means we're getting into more complex um, authentication models. And um, um, my colleague Chuck Mortimer, who many of you know, has been very much involved with combining um, OAuth and SAML and making sure that stuff works well at enterprise scale. And there's a bunch of really interesting delegation issues in that as well. Great, it's, uh, it's great to have uh, such a such an expert panel on identity here today. Uh, so uh, just since we're trying to have like a real panel here, um, so if, you, if you're on Twitter, you can, uh, <laughs> you know, you can tweet. Uh, so uh, the hashtags for today will be uh, half open ID, and uh, maybe we'll start talking about NIMS and stuff a little bit later. Um, and also the, uh, the Twitter handles uh, for, uh, for those of us on the panel are, uh, are listed here. So, so de definitely out of, out of uh, all the panelists, and myself included, uh, Kevin is probably the most uh, prolific uh, Twitter user. So. <laughs> so bad. Okay. Yeah, he has much to say on, on identity. Uh, so, so just to kick things off, uh, just to set the tone, I wanted to, uh, to show the, the most reprinted cartoon from the New, York, uh, from the New Yorker magazine, which was from uh, Jan July 5th, 1993, which was quite a long time ago. Uh, so this is actually the motto of uh, the Internet Identity Workshop. So on the internet, nobody knows that you're a dog. And that's how things were, at least when I, when I first got on the internet. So, uh, because, um, I mean, it was pretty liberating back then, right? I mean, you could, you were free from uh, having to express your name or your gender, your looks, your location, or even your, your dogness. I mean, you could just be whatever you wanted to be. 
and uh, that's that's how that's how identity was on the internet at least uh, way back then. Uh, obviously, things have changed quite a bit. And hopefully, we'll talk about a little bit about that in a bit. Uh, so, before I can even start about talking about identity, um, there's just lots of really confusing terminology and inconsistent terminology, and also there's just lots of different ways in which uh, identity and accounts and uh, can be provisioned uh, in an application or across an enterprise organization. Uh, so I was uh, wondering if each of the panelists could uh, talk a little bit about how users and accounts uh, are provisioned at the respective uh, companies. Um, so, so Andy, uh, so since I, I know you've been talking quite a bit already, uh, but can you uh, maybe give us an overview of how uh, users and groups and sub-accounts, uh, how, how, how is that set up uh, at Yahoo? Okay, um, so I'll start, um, maybe just a simplification of it. So at Yahoo, uh, each user has an account, obviously. Um, so each account, uh, when I say account, uh, we actually tie that account to uh, database record. Um, and for each one of the record, you could essentially have multiple personas, multiple profiles if you'd like to. So um, i give you a quick example. So I can log in with my Yahoo ID, and when I navigate to Flickr, I can have a different screening versus when I go to, let's say, Yahoo Fantasy Sports or Yahoo Games, I could have another screen name. So but when I make a comment on a, a news article, I could also choose what I wanted to display it. So we give these users, so ultimately in the back end, for the system itself, it's really one account we like to. That's the ideal situation. But for the user, we give the user flexibility to be able to say, okay, how I want to be appear to the public. So we do give that user the option. So that's why. Uh, so I guess the simple model is one account, multiple personas. Obviously, we cannot prevent user from creating a multiple account. So a lot of like, users do have multiple accounts. For, my, for example, myself, I have two accounts, one for work, one for uh, I use with friends, for example. Okay. Uh, do, do, uh, do users tend to use their real names uh, for, their, for their Yahoo personas? Um, good question. Um, I think probably about 50-50. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> depending on where they are on the, on the property. Uh -huh. So I think uh, user on Flickr, again, it's very property driven what we found is um, Flickr, especially they're using the service with their friends, they tend to be much more authentic who they are. Uh, versus if you make a comment, that's probably like 50-50. Like most people don't want it, especially when they make a, um, a political statement or anything of that sort, they tend to shy away from using their real names. Um, so, so Larry, as a as a SaaS provider, uh, you, you have a, you have exposure to lots of different websites and also lots of different user accounts. Um, how 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 uh, how do you envision uh, users using accounts across sites? Yeah, that, that's right. So, you know, generally it's not a destination site. So, all of our services are on behalf of other customers, and really we are enablers. So, if they want to take a third party account, we enable that. If they want to link multiple accounts together, we enable that. We also allow uh, customers to issue IDs um, to be used either on um, partners or internet-wide. Uh, so if they have their own user database and they really just want to expose those users to, to Yahoo or something, um, we can enable an open ID output out of that. Um, and we also actually have a, a user database product that we can outsource that entire soup to nuts. And the policies around all of those use cases are our customers. And it does vary. Uh, we do have customers who want to enforce real names, and we have other customers who um, maybe they're political or they're more entertainment bound. Um, and uh, the fact that uh, the person not using real names are relevant. Mm -hmm. So, so do, uh, do sites which use uh, Jamming products do they tend to let users have multiple accounts, and are, are they linked together, or, or do users just log in with different accounts when they want to be different personas, even on the same site? Yeah, it's definitely in both. Mm -hmm. um, so you do have um, sites that want to enable power users to identify themselves. Um, um, this person on Facebook, and this person on Twitter, and this person on Google, and treat them as one person. And we other sites, either they don't care about the scenario, or they want really the ability to create uh, independent accounts. And again, that's more policy driven and uh, not something we would enforce, and I don't think there's a right or wrong there. Okay, uh, Frank? So, to, to understand the, the uh, different types of nomenclature that we use for identity, you've got to look at the human use cases that happens in commerce. Uh, on one hand, we have users who want to have multiple buying accounts, and that's for a number of reasons, because they buy different things, or 
for competitive reasons, they want to have different buying accounts. Then we have sellers who want to have different selling accounts because they sell different things again. They sell cell phones and also they sell soap and they don't want to use the same brand for, for both of them. Uh, then you have uh, uh, businesses who have multiple users who handle different parts of their business. Uh, some of them handle uh, the, the inquiries during the transaction, some of them handle the complaint, all of that stuff. So all of these maps to identities, different types of identities. And uh, still called, I was 98, where our identity structure was completely flat. The only thing we had was a number of users. For every single thing, you have to create a user. And that cl clearly doesn't work, because these users have different scopes. They don't have access to each other's workspaces, each other's transactions. So people had real troubles. Now, ever since we are in the transition of matching our identity structure to what the real world actually wants, and what we have in place now is that we have accounts, and accounts have users, and we attach personas to the users, and credentials to the users, not at the account level. So when you log in, you're logging as a user, and you can select some persona by, by which you can be known to the public for the duration of this session. And some of these accounts, uh, you should be able to use this across multiple properties. Some of these accounts are only meant for eBay. You can really use this to log in to say other properties, like stop and PayPal. Like so uh, there is these different nomenclatures that we use and we have a particular structure uh, of, I guess, what well, I'm actually curious to see if, if this is of interest to the community. We have all of these different uh, names that by which we refer to these different constructs. And I think we benefit, at least I know that internally we have benefited across 20, 30 sites from some standardization of these names, account, user, personas, display name, username, all of these things, for some model to say, okay, here is, as a community, when we talk about this stuff, this is what we mean actually by this. Uh, that probably would be, uh, my experience is a good, good thing to have. Kevin, so uh, at Salesforce, how do they do things? Um, well, there's lots of different answers to that. Salesforce is, is fairly big with names multitudes, and also I'm betting you there, so I'll probably miss chunks of this out. Um, but the primary model is that Salesforce is mostly modeling um, what you might call business card identity, as opposed to um, personal home identity, if you want to think about it in those terms. So the, the, the presumption is that this is your your business, the address you hand up, your business card, the phone number, the, the company name, and that sort of thing. Um, our primary customers are, are, are corporations, and the, the presumption there is that there's an email address within that corporate domain that's used to, you know, to separate the, the users of the different domains. But then what many, what most of those people are modeling are actually their customers. So there they have, um, they're entering information about other people and storing that in there. And then what make, add, making this more complex is there's, we also own um, a site called data.com, which is recently renamed, um, which is um, a repository of business cards that um, people have submitted, which they've already found, which you can use as a lookup to, to populate these databases as well. So that there are a series of relationships like this, but the intention is to model what um, people's sort of public personas as, as business entities rather than as individuals in general. Um, and that, um, we're starting to, to see as we move to um, modeling customers um, for companies that, that are, are, are actually doing you know, business to consumer rather than business to business, we're starting to need to, to um, model individuals as well. So there's a that, that, that sort of mental model is starting to break down a bit. We're hitting a bunch of interesting issues there. Okay. It just sounds like there's a just very complex and, and also very different way to, uh, to model identity across different organizations. Uh, at least my personal experience, I've always found that, um, at least when integrating these uh, single sign-on protocols, it's not so much the, the protocol or the login stuff, which is a, a hard, it's actually pretty simple. It's actually trying to bolt uh, that data onto your existing user database in the way you model users and groups. It's uh, very, very complex. Um, so one of the topics that we want to talk about is uh, how, to, how to map a real world, uh, how to map a web identity to a real world um, identity. Uh, so one of the primary cases where this happens, uh, as I know Fran wanted to talk about this, was um, how a, a transaction online might start off uh, using personas and pseudonyms, uh, but then when it's actually time to finish uh, the transaction, actually exchange the goods and pay for it, uh, well you need to, to 
move on to the real world uh, uh, in, in order to facilitate payments. Um, so, so far, um, so is real identity required um, in order to uh, in order to facilitate a payment or in order to facilitate transactions? Well, it, it depends from whose point of view you were talking. Uh, the, 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 there's a lot of different scenarios in commerce, a lot of different scenarios, and, and what we call transactions happens in different ways. I mean, take a simple auction transaction, for example. Uh, when you bid, actually even at, at eBay right now, when you bid to the rest of the community, you're completely anonymous. I mean, you go in and look at the bid history of something, the rest of the community doesn't know that, that you bid actually on something. To the seller, you're pseudonymous. The seller doesn't know who you are, but it knows your handle on eBay, basically. Once the auction is over, obviously, then you have to take some other measure. And that measure can be, okay, I have to reveal your real identity to the seller now, and then it is between you and seller, depending on the kind of assurances that you offer. That's one way to do it. But the other way to do it uh, does not require the revealing of identity. All the seller honestly cares about, or at least most sellers, some sellers different, depending on what the merchandise is, is that you assure them to receive the, the payment. So for some, use cases, we have an escrow that we get the, the payment, we give the payment to the seller, uh, to the seller, and the seller sends the item. Now, again, if you intermediate, the item can be sent to some other location, and that other location can be sent, they can send it to the buyer. So, for most use cases today, yes, the real identity is required because the seller has to send the stuff to you at the end of the day, and has to make sure that it receives the money. But for certain set of uh, different transactions, you really don't need real identity. So this issue of real identity, whether you need it or whether you don't need it, whether it's good for payment or for commerce or not, really depends on who you are and the kind of services that you offer. And then we offer all of these different things. Um, so, so Andy, at, at Yahoo, one of the things I noticed was uh, when you register for an account, um, the registration form asks for your, your real name, right, and your real birthday. But, but yet you can have these different profiles on, on Yahoo properties which are completely separate. What's the relationship between uh, public profile data and, and registration data? Okay. Um, so the constant there is when a user uh, first registered with Yahoo, we take that information as what we call registration account. And that data is primarily really for allowing the user to be able to recover the password or recover the ID. So whatever you provide as a user initially the first time, uh, the first name, uh, obviously name, most people you know, it could be real or fake, you know, uh, but at least the date of birth or the security answer to the question that you have to remember. So, or you can provide an alternate email address. That's what, to, the, to Alan's point, is registration data. Post that event, uh, the user is free to add a profile. So you could change his name, first name, last name, even certain point in gender or the location or the so forth. So we really don't have a policy that say you can't change anything. So for those are what we call public profiles of the user, how he wants to be appear on the network, uh, Yahoo network to other Yahoo. Um, so that they, they have the flexibility to change that. So that's the distribution. Did you answer that question? Oh, sure. Yeah, but Andy, you clarify that uh, you said that the first time around you would ask for do you have legal text? Or are there any legal implications if they put the false name there? No, that's, no, I don't think any website has legal, is enforcing that at this point as far as I know. Well, some, some sites, some sites. Have terms of use on uh, requiring users to register with uh, with common names. Common, yes. So, uh, not least, something. I guess or, they have logic in there. Or at least I, I think. I, I don't remember exactly what the Facebook toss is, but I think you're supposed to register with your real name, right? Yeah. So, so Frank, how about a, 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 for an eBay site? So you, do users or merchants required to use their real names and their real identities and uh, sellers and buyers? eBay is a marketplace. Mm -hmm. We require buyers and sellers to reveal to us their real identity. But whether we reveal it to the rest of the community, that's a different story. It depends on the use cases. But when somebody bids on, on something, the seller needs to know that you are real. They don't need to know exactly who you are, but they need to know that you are real. So we put a lot of effort and a lot of money into actually verifying uh, the, the first name and the last name and the address and the phone number, not so much the date of birth. Uh, we, and, and there's tiered uh, uh, 
levels to it. If you're a seller and you're selling beyond certain things or you're selling beyond categories or you're selling uh, a very highly publicized auction, obviously, things like that, uh, we do an utmost verification on your identity and then from that point on it goes, goes down. If you're selling five bucks worth of stuff on eBay every year, then the verification is much, much less. So we do require real names and real addresses and, and phone numbers for buyers and sellers. And real bank accounts. Real bank accounts, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so, so one of the issues with uh, dealing with uh, with dealing with the web identities is trust and reputation. Um, so how do you know that the person that you're uh, talking to or dealing with or trying to transact with is actually uh, who they say they are, or is, it, or is it even reputable? Um, so I know uh, eBay was probably the very first company to actually uh, implement a reputation system with the, with the buyer <coughs> feedback and the seller feedback and the, uh, the, the points and so on. Uh, so, so Frank, can you talk a little bit about eBay's reputation system and, and how it's used and how it's developed and maybe where you guys can go forward with it? So I, I, I give a very brief history of it. I mean, you, you guys are familiar with eBay feedback, traditionally what it was positive, negative feedback. I don't want to go into the designer reputation system. Are you po uh, tracking positive reputation, negative reputation, or what, how do you maintain the integrity of the reputation? What are the virtuous actions that you track the reputation on? But eBay system was very simple at the beginning, positive and negative, and, and that led into to a whole lot of different you know, adverse scenarios. The feedback system that you look at today, very briefly, really is a, a two-tiered system. There's a reputation that we calculate and we show to, to the community, and there's a reputation that the seller internally has with us, and that ties into uh, financial consequences, discounts or the lack of discount, and it's actually very very major and business sensitive. So we kind of separated these two from each other. Uh, for the sake of the, the community, uh, identity community, I think what's important really is not the reputation system. It's that how do you protect the integrity of it, and first and foremost, how do you make sure that the person maintains the same ID for some time to develop this reputation? I mean, it's very easy to get to come and accumulate a bunch of negative uh, feedbacks and go back and create a new account with all you need is a couple of email addresses. And if actually this is the case, you can't really do anything uh, with your reputation system. One thing, and I think we are at the end, we are talking about what we think the trends are and the predictions. I think one of the, the trends or one of the areas of activity that are going to be much more uh, important going forward with the advent of digital identity is, is this quality of information, entity resolution, making sure that a person that comes in and gives you one set of information and then next time comes you and give you a different set of information. How do you make sure that this person is actually the same person? And you don't let that person to develop fake reputation on your system. Uh, actually, for us, it has financial uh, consequences because we have limits and we have uh, bounds on how much you can sell so that we manage your risk. But if you just go and create 20 accounts and we don't know who you are and you completely violate all of our, all of our limits without us having any control, then that obviously is very serious. So that part of it, I think, it's not so much reputation, but the quality of your identity <coughs> attributes and how you can actually relate it to yeah, so, so just clarification again. So uh, interesting, uh, Paul, uh, since you know uh, about this required uh, verified DNA address and so on, why is it within the policy to allow that person to create multiple accounts? What's the rationale for that? So creation of multiple accounts actually has real use cases. Like I said, you might be a seller. And we are trying to mitigate this with, uh, with, with a different identity architecture. But for now, if you're a seller and you're selling different things, it's pretty legitimate to have different selling accounts uh, because uh, these selling accounts, they accumulate feedback differently. Uh, if you're selling Mexican art and you're selling cell phones in two different communities, you want to have two different personas. Uh, in each community, they have different tolerance for negative feedback or positive feedback. They mean different things. So there are use cases, legitimate use cases for people to have multiple accounts. But obviously, there are there are people who have multiple accounts for not so good reasons. So I don't think you can ban the, the answer to that question is not to ban the account, multiple accounts. It's to have some system in the back end that at least has something to do with the fact that these people are really the same guys. So, so would that be a pain in the head?
uh, no, it would not be. It, it, in our, for us, it's a different system. We call but it because the resolution. Right. Because, yeah. uh, sometimes they can have multiple payment instruments as well. Right. Actually, they do have multiple. Yes. They can get a credit, credit card, a one time use gift uh, card, so you get a Visa gift card. It's actually from the payment card, you use a credit card. It's undistinguishable from credit card. So it's very easy to duplicate that as well. Yeah. So this is a quick question for Larry. So, so one of the so, so Larry and Janrai have been involved in OpenID as product for, for as long as I can remember. Actually, so he's one of the, uh, the earliest participants in the OpenID community. And one of the things that uh, one of the main selling points of OpenID, at least to me initially, was being able to use an identity that you already have. Uh, primarily because an identity that you already have would have a reputation attached to it. So I was wondering, Larry, uh, do you? Uh, the reliant parties that you've interacted with, do they primarily want people to log in with an existing identity for the reputation aspect of it, or is it mostly just to uh, lower the ease of friction or the friction associated with logging in? Yeah, for sure, right now it is to get higher conversion, uh, leveraging that, that account and password and authentication method that you already have. Um, I don't think it's lost on everyone that, that once you have an identifier that crosses the border of websites, you can do interesting things. and. Uh, for the most part, uh, users can assume that uh, it will benefit good users. So that, that very large market of high reputation and users um, can expect uh, you know, better web interactions if their identifiers leverage the web. Okay. So, uh, so segueing into uh, real identity and reputation. So uh, not too long ago, uh, there was an interesting article in the New York Times by Julie Zhao, who uh, actually came to one of our open ID summits not too long ago. Uh, so she's, a, she's an interaction designer. Or she's a design manager at Facebook. And uh, she wrote an interesting op-ed piece in the, in the New York Times uh, about how uh, online anonymity uh, breeds contempt. And uh, real identity is, is uh, definitely a great way to encourage civil discussion. I just have a question about a term you're using. What does real identity mean? So that's, <laughs> that's an interesting term. So um, at least at least when I think about real identity, it's mostly uh, involved. It, it's mostly uh, involving using your real name as well as maybe your picture. Uh, common name's a little bit different. So at least at least when I think about identity woman here, I I, I first think of her as identity woman rather than Kalia Hamlin. But yeah, whatever works. But in either case, it's tied to a real person. Uh, that, 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 again, uh, since we're talking about this, uh, this interesting. Real people? Hmm? I said, but aren't all identities tied to real people? Some people can can play personas online, right? So. Well, it also you have an identity identity, mm -hmm. and that's not a person. Not it's not a real person, and not an individual. So. So one, one thing I wanted to just ask the panel. Uh, so I know I know Kevin Marks uh, has it's quite a bit to say about this. Uh, just wondering, uh, is it really a good thing to enforce uh, so-called real identity, whatever real identity might actually mean uh, on, on websites? This is uh, definitely an interest. This is uh, this is a pattern which is, uh, seems to be increasing over time. So I remember in the past we always used to be able to just create a synonymous identifier tied to nothing in particular to be able to post comments, but now. Uh, definitely with the, uh, the rise of uh, commenting widgets, which force real identity, it uh, seems to be uh, more widespread that users are forced to use uh, their real names and pictures in order to participate online. Well, the, the, quite, the thing is, we run into the real again. It, it's a question of have they been verified by everyone or not? So, what, the, um, what I was objecting to recently was that the identity theater, which says um, you have to have something that, that looks plausibly real um, on this site. You have to have a name that fits some arbitrary criteria that we have, um, as opposed to something you, you've chosen yourself. Um, so you have this sort of weird Procrustean automated identif uh, identif identification verification that isn't actually verifying anything at all. Um, and then you, um, then you get into weird daisy chains of people challenging each other, then using that as a weapon against each other to, you know, in the same way that you have fake accounts where people say that um, you report each other to the, to the authorities. So, so these are fake accounts that look real but they're fake, right? They're, well, there are fake accounts that look real, there are real accounts that look fake. The, the problem is, is the presumption is often closer to the idea of um, someone who's, you know, um, effectively the kind of pretend identity that you need if you're running a business process outsourcing firm and want to pretend to be a normal American um, on the phone, 
Uh, that's the kind of rules that, that we're seeing appearing in some of these things because it's like, you don't look right to me, I'm, I don't want you in the system. Um, and that is, that is, that, uh, I've seen several rule sets like that. Um, and the Google Plus stuff is the, is the most recent example. There are other examples like that. You mentioned Facebook as something that, that has um, policed this intermittently in the past. Um, and a lot of this is very contextual. The question is, what is the, the context that this is being used in, and where does it make sense? I talked about um, business cards. A business card is a persona. Um, when you hand someone a business card, you're saying, this is me in my work persona, um, and here's a bunch of ways you can get hold of me um, through work. Um, but if you, if you, you may write you know, a home phone number or a, a, a personal cell phone number as well as an additional way of contacting. We, we're used to having many of these different contextual identifiers. Um, and if you're trying to put a, a general service, um, you need to actually think about the use cases, uh, that's uh, what I'm saying. Um, and say, what are we using this for? In what context does this make sense? And the challenge is if you've got an identity service that is being used for multiple purposes, you've got to be very careful that these things don't bleed across and, and, and you know, effectively damage the, the other pieces of the system. Okay. So, so Andy, at, at Yahoo, um, uh, Yahoo accepts a Yahoo ID, which is, I guess, the classic synonymous identifier, as well as uh, Google and, and Facebook. I was just wondering, uh, based on, uh, on your experience, uh, do users behave differently depending on which type of identifier they log in with? Like, say, do, do Facebook users using a real identity uh, behave significantly different than users who log in with the synonymous identifiers? Uh, so we don't have quantifi quantifiable data to prove one way or another, so at this point. Uh, but we do notice uh, Facebook user and the Google user, when they come from a third-party uh, identity provider, they tend to be more engaging. So I don't know if that's an indication of that. They tend to, for example, uh, the late Google users tend to spend more time on, say, Twitter. Mm -hmm. So maybe because uh, but my theory is because the user coming from Google, Facebook got again real, more credible user, whereas the other camp of the Yahoo, I think there might be some mix of a lot of user or people to sign up for trolling, as you pointed out. Uh, so that's what we see, at least that's, that's what, what, what I observed at this point. Okay, so, so one of the, at least in, in your previous talk, I noticed that there was a significant difference in terms of the, the success rate or completion rate uh, relative to Facebook users and Google users. It looked like it was like Google users got through about 20% more of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think maybe it might have something to do with the fact that a Facebook identity might have more information associated with it than say maybe a Google account? Yeah, so uh, probably not really, but uh, for Facebook users, we, we ask Yahoo asked more data uh, mm -hmm. because Facebook users tend to have more which are more of a social graph. So when we ask more data, uh, we notice a lot that Facebook users are much more uh, sensitive, sensitive about what they're about to share with the mm -hmm. party. So they tend to, when they see the long list of permissions that's being displayed back to them, say, we're getting everything you have, they tend to shy away from clicking on the permit button. Okay. That's, I think, what, again, going back to what drives the discrepancy between the per, uh, conversion rates. Okay, since, uh, so, so Larry, since Jamrin works with a wide variety of identity providers and also Reliant Parties, I was wondering if uh, you're seeing an increase in uh, Reliant Parties wanting to use real identity or preferring to use real identity um, over some of the uh, more synonymous uh, identity providers. You know, on the identity provider side, uh, we don't see any uh, specific trends. Uh, on the Reliant Party side, um, uh, the, the focus is on getting the minimal set of data to um, create a valid user on their website. And often that is a, a first, last name, and an email address. Uh, email address is very important. You know, verified email address is, is, uh, is really sort of the, the gold piece there. But it's also um, very contextual on, on what uh, providers of website will use. Uh, we have a customer who um, allows people to apply for college online. So there you're very intent to use your real name. And um, so even if they have a Facebook, um, uh, ability, uh, a user is probably going to want to use that only if that is really the name they want on their college education or their college application and so forth. So some of it is self-policing by the context, which I think is the theme that uh, everyone's sort of expressing here. Is, is getting photographs uh, a key part of using the delegate methods? You know, I think uh, the more social side is that, that helps. Uh, there's a lot of research uh, that shows that, that um, pictures, pictures of your friends actually add to the, um, the user engagement. So. Um, that, that is certainly um, a thing. Again, we have dating customers who, um, uh, you know, 
don't use that photo, they want to use it upload something different. And so again, it's context that uh, makes it. And users might not want their Facebook photo um, uh, to be used on that site too. So it's, yeah, so it's a mix. The college application is that special Facebook profile to make that. Yeah. <laughs> Could be. Uh, one, one of the supposed advantages of using real identity is uh, that people using real identity are less likely to uh, post a spam or, or a troll. So I was wondering, Larry, if, if you noticed that there's any significant difference between the behavior of, of accounts or the behavior of real identity accounts versus uh, maybe more thorough way synonymous accounts on sites. Uh, no, I don't think we have the data. Um, I, I think we see a variety, a wide variety of volume uh, on customers, but it's, but it's more the content of the website rather than I think the, the provider. Okay. Uh, so, an interesting topic that, that Kevin uh, raised a little bit earlier about the identity theater. Uh, so, so, some some websites uh, require users to uh, register with common names uh, for some arbitrary definition of common names. I, I guess identity is not an actual common name. So uh, I was just wondering, um, as one, one of the things that Kevin actually raised was that perhaps users could register a common name if it didn't seem quite right or didn't match the right filter, perhaps a user could uh, somehow verify their name somehow out of band. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on how name verification might actually work. Well, I think the, the problem is is when you're trying to automate this because actually names are really complicated things that um, we can't actually model very well in software. So what you're better off doing is doing the kind of things you were saying. Reveal the account information to the users and then let them make the decisions individually. Um, and examples of, of you know, the verified name ticks, the things like that you've shown, they, they have different things on different sites. Amazon has done this for a long time. You can write reviews on Amazon. Um, and if you use the same name <coughs> they have, on the credit card they have on the file, they will put a little tick next to you saying this is this is a real name. Um, so when I read the reviews, I can say, oh, he's using his real name for that. It's probably not the author reviewing his own book. Um, so you can give that information to, to the, the person viewing it and let them make the decision what makes sense and what doesn't. Because the thing is, particularly in the sites where you're um, discussing things and doing that over time, you get to recognize the people. But the key thing, it, you, as you were saying, is, is persistence. It's saying, okay, is this person the same person as the other person, or are these five people, you know, variants on the same person discussing with each other to make that thing look good? Um, being able to tell that can be helpful. But, but recognizing the individuals um, over time is how you trust them. And a key part of that is also the faces. If you're looking at the, the face of the person is a very strong recognition marker one that's quite hard in our, in, our, in our brains. So seeing the same face in, in different contexts will, will help you do that. Um, and it, I'm interested that none of these sites seem to be saying, oh yes, we're, we're insisting on real faces, that they're not trying to verify that. Um, whereas that would seem a, you know, a logical thing to do if you're starting to say, saying, oh, I want to make sure this really is the person. Whereas if you think about um, security systems and corporate systems, they do tend to have photographs on them. You know, the, I'm carrying a bunch of things in my wallet that have my photo on that I have to present in different places to say, yes, this is really me. Um, but we don't nest normally bring those into, the, into these contexts. Okay. Uh, so, so Brian, at, at eBay and PayPal, like how, how are names actually verified? Like, do you actually have an out-of-band system to let users and uh, sellers verify the real names? I don't know, so names? Names in commercial context, like the, the two types of names you're talking about, uh, names of real people. And the names of businesses, and, and they're, they're like equally important. Like if you have uh, somebody that comes in and registers a persona called Beach Camera, California, there might be Beach Camera out in I don't know New Jersey, and there might be some some arbitration over who has the right claim to this name. I mean, obviously we don't we don't do the arbitration right now because we have no authority to, to do this. But this is the kind of stuff that comes up. Uh, we. We mitigate this basically by saying there, there are two types of things. One is your legal obligation to the community and to the eBay. And for that, whatever name that you have in your financial instrument and, and it's good to the legal system is good for us. So for us, real identity really means legal identity, whatever, whatever it is that, that the legal system is fine with it. And then the other one is that how do you want to introduce yourself to the, to the community? And that, to a large degree, depends on you and the responsibility that we take over there is to make sure that this is persistent and you cannot uh, move, if you move from one identity to another identity to another personas basically, we make sure that we know this relationship. So you cannot create fake 
reputation or create bad experience and move on and then start all over again. So that's how we manage this issue of real identity. Yeah, I wanted to touch on the topic of having multiple identities. Uh, so users nowadays tend to have multiple identities uh, which are tightly focused, perhaps, uh, tightly focused, but they all refer to the same person. So for instance, in, in my personal case, I have lots of different identifiers uh, across the web. Uh, all of them refer to me, um, and they're all, interestingly, uh, referred to uh, using an URL. Uh, so uh, Fred Wilson is a relatively famous VC uh, blog recently uh, that he doesn't have a single online identity, he has many. They are rich, representative, and different from each other. Uh, at least for the, uh, the open ID old school <coughs> folks, uh, the, the next sentence is kind of interesting. So he said he, he likes the idea that an URL can be an ID, ID, but he doesn't like the idea that one URL is your ID. He likes the idea that a list of URLs makes up your ID. So it's so interesting how, how we've come full circle now and uh, URLs are now uh, interesting as identifiers. So de definitely, definitely if you've been following open ID, that's an interesting topic. So, uh, so I, had, yeah, I know uh, we mentioned in, uh, earlier that, that Yahoo users tend to have multiple, e even, within, even within the Yahoo network, they might have multiple URLs or multiple profiles across properties. Can you talk a little bit more about like, why you have multiple profiles as opposed to a single unified profile? Well, I really we like that single profile, but that's not the real reality because most user consumer, even in our research study, when the user come in, Small sample size, they all tend to want to have multiple identities. It just, that's the way they want to be, and I don't think we can deviate from that. That's kind of human nature, in my, in my belief. So, for, even for a Facebook user, they, they, I have multiple Facebook accounts one is for my friends and, and one's for family. Uh, so, that's what we're seeing as well on Yahoo is people tend to create uh, multiple accounts if they want to have, uh, say, appearing as one uh, login handle on, let's say, Yahoo Answers. There's a Yahoo Mail. So Yahoo Mail tend to be more uh, real estate if they are legitimate users. So that's at least what we see. So we don't preclude, there's technically no way we would preclude user from creating multiple ID. And we have come to accept that's just the practice. So. Okay. Uh, Larry, do you, do you envision a, a world in which uh, every service could be an identity provider? So one of the things with uh, OpenID Connect is that it allows any OAuth 2 service provider to become an identity provider. Uh, potentially uh, opening up the long tail of identity providers. Uh, do, you, do you think that this this might actually be uh, something that might emerge? More, uh, more identities? Maybe. Uh, it probably stretches what we call IDP right now. Um, certainly, I think there's a uh, look and, and call it you know maybe a claims provider. Um, I, I could definitely see that model building out where your identity is made uh, by the aggregation of uh, different assertions at different sites or we're given authority to make on here. So uh, that, that, that's a very rich system to build out. I think we're, uh, uh, we're pretty far away from that right now, but I think the building blocks are starting to get for that. Uh, I do think uh, a collection of roles is interesting. It's a very um, creative site, Claim ID, which I think is still running, uh, which essentially was very early in the process of making that a destination site that you would list your uh, list of identifiers uh, that, that point to you. And uh, I know in the early adopter community, I got a lot of but there's also the, the Realm Eve standard for that, which mm -hmm. is linking between the different profiles with Rally Calls Me that says this is me. And if they're mutually pointing, then you can verify that they're both the same person, or at least the first same person has control of this on both sides, which isn't necessarily the same thing. Um, and that means that you can do this bundling, both in a distributed way without actually having to go to the site register or anything. And that's something that, that actually works quite well. I know, I know Google uses that as part of their social model stuff. Um, and because it's, because it's you know, a trivial change to the, the market with the sign, then that can work. And you can combine that with the actual auth stuff. So that gives you a route where I've authenticated to this account, it, I can then trust, then I can take the assertions that point out from that, and take the assertions back and build the, the cluster that, that is that, that person that way. So a user can log in with one account, but also share all their... Yes, it's just share some of them, a, a, a subset of them. <laughs> but again, you know, in any of these places, you may have more than one account in different places to them together. Uh, it, and yeah, it becomes harder to actually maintain it if you want to do that. But you have both of these situations. You either say, okay, I'm using these sites for different functional things. I've got my photographs on Flickr, I've got my tweets on Twitter, I've got my blog posts on my blog, but I want to bind them together as one, one person. Um, but then it's like I may have multiple Twitter accounts for, for different roles I, I play. I don't necessarily want to bind those together to any of these other sites. Okay. Uh, 
So I know uh, I think I'm running a little bit over time, so I don't want to squash uh, the next uh, next speakers. So we already talked a bit, a bit about account contributors, and so I think I'll skip that. Um, I do want to touch a little bit about uh, email addresses as the one true identifier. So, so Larry, you mentioned that most RPs specifically want to get an uh, email address. Um, is, that, is that usually the, and also on Andy, I, mean, I also noticed that at least on, on Yahoo's registration or mini registration screen, the only required field was email address, right? Or at least the, the thing that you expect to get from the IDP is the email address. Um, is email address the most important thing? And, and if so, why, why do you require email address for, for your users? Well, for me, I think this is no, no news, but uh, email address is uh, easily verifiable. So, um, so that's why we use that as a common identifier. Also, from a legal perspective, they want to be able to reach out to that person and be able to say, this is that person. Uh, but beyond email, I actually have an opinion on that. Is also with exploring Yahoo, exploring even using mobile number, given that mobile marketplace is growing like game busters. So we noticed that. Um, so we might, I mean, that could be the potential, the next identifier for the, for the next coming years uh, as mobile number. People are now becoming much more uh, willing to share that number, mobile number. So, so Larry, is email address the, the most uh, most requested attribute? That the last part of the last it is, and uh, I think it will be for, for a period of time. There's certainly uh, a development of, of a bunch of channels to reach that end user that are in the making, whether it's the Facebook inbox, whether it's Twitter, or whether it's an SMS or, or some way. Um, email is still uh, the main way. There's history, there's some you know legalities around it. Um, uh, I would think a couple years out that, that maybe it's a need to reach the user in some method. It may not just be email, and that may not be the um, the golden field anymore, but for uh, for at least the next 12 months, I think it's important to be. I wonder if you have found it to be a problem in terms of malware causing uh, you know, emails, uh, sending out numerous messages. I mean, if, if the technology can allow that to happen, what would that mean if it has some you know, commerce uh, implications? If your email has been somehow misused, uh, and the messages being sent, and if that can be done, what else could be done in terms of commerce? Well, certainly everyone recognizes email as a weak identifier and it's a weak transport mechanism. Um, is that a part of the problem? But we have clearly seen that if email is, is exposed, then it creates all sorts of opportunity for the down takeovers and for social engineering, for phishing, for all sorts of stuff. Uh, but I, I've seen the same trend that um, even internally when we provide the identity to any client party, the first thing they ask for is email address. That's actually before, before first name and last name. And we do have a lot of like, real verified first name, first name and last name. I think part of it is driven by the legal aspect of it, which have some way of reaching people. But I agree that for some time to come, email will be the goal of the well, I have to agree because I think it's, it's, a, it's a fetish that we're stuck with, but it's now very bizarre that I have to provide an email address to sign up for an email account. Um, so this <laughs> recursive chain of emails, most of which I've, I've not touched for a long time. Um, and it, it is you know, relatively easy to make a, make a new one, you can start from somewhere, right? and then you can spawn one on the other accounts and other accounts, and then you can make those and then throw them away. So, the, the, the presumption that I'm actually going to read an email that, that's sent to me by one of your robots is, is increasing the books. I, I, I don't think people care about whether you read your emails or not, they just care about sending an email to you that, that satisfies something. Right, I mean, see, it's the problem. <laughs> exactly, this is the problem. The email has these sort of backwards of forms, and all you can do with it is annoy people and can't actually find any more useful information. Okay. Uh, so I think I um, just wanted to finish up with uh, predictions for the future. So uh, Andy already mentioned that uh, mobile, mobile seems to be the next frontier for, for authentication. Larry, right, where, where do you think we're going to be going next? Uh, I think we're on, on a trend where uh, leveraging the we have is something that's starting to resonate with consumers. So I think, um, and, and this is no big secret in line with where we want to see it go too, but uh, I think uh, registering for new accounts on uh, every website go to um, really starts to diminish. Okay, Frank? So once I did have the opportunity to become eBay employee number five or six, and I refused. 
So I'm not an authority in what happens in the future. <laughs> 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 said that, uh, so I, I don't go into like futuristic stuff. Last night I was thinking. Last night I, I had to go to my insurance company to change my coverage for some reason, and uh, at, at the same time I was obviously logged into PayPal. And at PayPal I'm verified seven ways from Sunday. My address, phone number, email, the size of my pants, so the whole thing is verified completely, <laughs> tenth degree. And I was logged into PayPal and. This here was my insurance company, and it was asking me to log in with my password and some other things that they came up with. And I had no idea what this thing was. And I tried several things that they said, okay, so you gotta go to this other thing, answer the secret questions, and the secret question was, I have some, some weird questions I, I don't even remember. So I, I was not able to really log in, and I had to pick up the phone, call these guys, go back and forth, you guys have been through this whole thing. And it was half an hour. And at the end, I was thinking, this has to stop. This does not make, make economical sense. This does not make sense any, for me. This not, doesn't make sense for anyone. And then these guys are not any more secure than PayPal, for example. It, technology is in place, protocol is in place. And coincidentally, yesterday we were having some conversations, and somebody was mentioning that we are not disruptive enough uh, for some reason. And I was thinking, OK, so there's disruption in technology is one thing but there is social disruption. If this problem is solved across the economy and across all the things that we do, then that's, that's a huge disruption. I mean, that, that, is, that is a major thing. So I think we are close enough, yet not as close, to, to safely say that the path that we are on, which is this federated identity and the fact that people should not provision these user and passwords on every single site, even if they provide important services like insurance, that, that is the path that, that will go forward and the future, the, it's inevitable. There's economical force behind it. There's all sorts of force behind it that, that, that we are, we have to have these uh, federated model of authentication. So. Well, okay, well def definitely logging in with the account that you already have makes incredible sense to me, so definitely. It's not revolutionary, but we're not there yet. It's, it's so obvious, too, when you right. think about it. So, right. okay, so Kevin, what do you, what do you think? So, well, I'm not necessarily a great prognosticator either, given that I sold a Mac stock for $10. But um, the, one of the things is to, is to sort of rethink what we're doing when we start making databases for this stuff in the first place. And you know, every programmer seems to start out by doing an email address and password field, um, and then saying, oh, and everyone has one name and one phone number and stuff. And I winced a bit when you put up the, the user info thing um, this morning, because it was like the same thing again. Everyone has one email address and one phone number. How could it be more complicated than that? And then they have one name. And it's like, no, actually life is more complex than that. As, as Fred Wilson was saying, we are a collection of things. And so understanding the, the making the internal representations capable of, able to cope with this multiplicity so that when you go to your insurance site, um, you may have given them more than one thing over time and then you can go back and log in again um, with, the, with the, the secondary account that's also you and, and do some of this distributed verification and, and binding. And it starts making a lot more sense. Um, I remember Genevieve Bell in a speech a while back saying she got blocked out of her Yandu account because she couldn't remember what lie she told them about her date of birth. Yeah. Um, um, and historically, when you were presented with these forms to fill this stuff in, your first reaction is, why the hell do you need that? Um, and the, the best thing, that, you know, the best test for this that I, that I recommend is um, take the zip code field in your database um, and histogram that against the actual population of that zip code and see where the spikes are and you find there are two. Um, they are Beverly Hills and Chinectity. Because when people are lying to you, they either put in one, two, three, four, five, or nine, or two, one, um, <laughs> And it's, it's the same thing with date of birth. If you look at the date of birth field, they have all these, they, they look like this, they're like spike of the recurves, because um, all your things default to one, 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 and so people leave those alone, and they just fill up the year until, until they're old enough. Um, or they, they, you know, they, they, they do things like that. So most of this data in these systems is actually false. Um, and, it's, and it's because we didn't care enough to give the accurate information for that particular transaction. So part of the value of letting people do the delegated login is they don't have to fill in this, this fake information, but also they can bind to more useful information over time. Okay. So just, just as an aside, to verify uh, Kevin's remarks, uh, I actually took a look at Yahoo's uh, registration data before, and Schenectady is definitely the number one zip code in, in, for all of Yahoo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <so. laughs>
I, I do wonder how many like shopping centres have been built genetically by accident. <laughs> 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 okay. uh, well, I think our uh, time, time is up. I did want to put in a quick plug for the Internet Identity Workshop. So. Uh, one of the inspirations for this talk was uh, the, the dog with the mask. Um, so, the, so uh, again, uh, if you're interested in uh, talking about identity and personas, uh, definitely should consider going to the Internet Identity Workshop. Uh, the Identity Woman is, is here right now. Uh, definitely should uh, follow up with her if you're interested. A very quick 10-minute break, and then we'll reconvene. Thanks to the panel.